Okay. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Adele. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, guys, anytime when you're watching this, if you have any questions for Lisa and Andy, just pop it in the chat box because um, I'll be doing a Q&A with them at the end. Okay, right, we are live on Facebook. So hello everybody on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, my name's Amanda, I'm Deputy Editor of PB and I will be bringing you today's PB webinar. So today's session is going to be about your most common waxing questions answered. Um, today's session is sponsored by Salon System and in a minute I'm going to be posting a link into the Facebook comment box and onto the Zoom comment box um, with the Salon System URL so you can check out their full range of products and their stockists. Um, but today I'm joined by Andy Rulliard, also known as the Wax Daddy. Um, he's the owner of ACM Bodyworks and ACM Wax Academy, and I'm also joined by Lisa Stone, who is Salon Systems waxing expert, and they are going to be talking through some of the top questions that people ask about waxing in this kind of barrel webinar. Um, and then at the end, we're going to have about 15, 20 minutes for a Q&A where you can ask them any burning questions that you have, and I'm sure you guys have got loads. So I'll just let Andy and Lisa introduce themselves, and then we will get going. So maybe Lisa, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. So hi, I'm Lisa, and I have been in the industry now for 27 years, so waxing all of that time. And it's pretty much been my favourite subject and my favourite treatment to actually work with and to actually teach. So as well as working as a therapist, I also am an educator for Training Solutions, who are the designated training company for Salon System. So I go all over the country doing training courses. That's pretty much my kind of full time job. And when I'm not teaching, I have a little treatment room where I, I do various treatments from home and waxing being the predominant one. That's me. <laughs> Andy? Hi everyone, I'm Andy Riard from Axiom Bodyworks Men's Grooming Salon in sunny Basingstoke, North Hampshire. Um, I also run the Axiom Wax Academy training school and we run classes all over the UK. Um, up north, Scotland, Midlands, we've got trainers coming on uh, down near Cornwall as well, uh, Wales, so we, we cover uh, quite a large area, specialise in men's waxing, and I worked with Salon System to help develop the Just Wax Expert range of waxes and skincare products. And we've come up with seven of our frequently asked questions that myself and Lisa often get asked as waxers and educators. So we're going to run through those, and then we're going to throw the floor open for you guys to ask questions. So if you have got questions, it might be a good idea to um, hold them just until the end because we're going to run through the seven that we've got prepared um, already. Hi Jack, hi Trisha, um, oh. and uh, sorry I just saw a na names pop up. I I there. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll run through those at the end. I'm, I'm a, bit, a little bit worried about it being a bear all wax. <laughs> I'm not quite ready for that. And I, don't... I know, we <laughs> just love a pun at PB, that's the problem. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you to everybody who's joined. I'm already recognising loads of waxes names in there. So it's lovely to see you guys this afternoon. Um, so maybe we'll start off with the first question, which is what's the best way of tackling ingrown hairs? I don't know if you want to start this off, Lisa. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first, it's really important to know exactly um, what an ingrown hair is and, and kind of what the kind of characteristics are. So first of all, an ingrown hair tends to be trapped underneath um, the layer of skin, the top layer of skin, and they kind of show themselves as being maybe a papule or a pustule, which can be slightly full of pus. Um, they can look red, um, very irritated. They can be quite painful. And usually with ingrown hairs, it tends to be more um, darker, thicker, coarser, curlier hair that tends to be um, a problem when it comes to ingrown hairs. We don't tend to find vellus soft hair as problematic. I'm not saying that it will never get ingrown, but it's definitely more the thicker, coarser hairs. So we tend to find them more on um, areas like a bikini line, um, thick, coarse leg hair, men's backs and chest. So that's the sort of areas that we're looking at. And we always say prevention is better than cure if we, if we can. So ways of avoiding them is to make sure that the skin is thoroughly exfoliated um, and that the client regularly exfoliates the skin and that they do it correctly because a lot of people and i've mentioned this before they they sort of merrily scrub away in the shower and they forget those areas of concern like underarms bikini line they miss them out completely um, so it's really important to make sure that when we're exfoliating we're exfoliating 
on a dry or damp skin, not soaking wet in the shower where the, the um, scrub is being washed away and, and dissolved, um, or do things like body brushing and using kind of like a really nice mitt to kind of really exfoliate the skin. And that will just remove the, the dead layer of skin and that will allow the hairs to grow through a little easier. But also just remembering to keep that skin moisturized on a daily basis so the skin is soft and that the hair is able to break through a little bit more. Um, so as long as we're kind of doing those on a regular basis, that should keep the ingrown hairs down. However, if they still continue to persist, then obviously we then need to look at treating, which Andy's going to talk about. Yeah, so ingrown hairs, the bane of waxes worldwide, absolutely. <laughs> and as Lisa said, you know, prevention is absolutely better than cure, but sometimes your clients can do everything right and they still suffer with the occasional ingrown, the nasty, nasty, stubborn ones. So in those instances, it's a really good idea to retail a specific ingrown hair product at your salon that will help to tackle those really stubborn ingrowns. And the key ingredient to look for in these products is something called salicylic acid, which is beta hydroxy acid. And the way that it works, it's a chemical exfoliant. So encourages the dead skin cells to slough off more readily so it helps to, to free the trapped hair. It's particularly great for ingrown hairs because it's lipid soluble so we can actually get down into the pore itself where the hair may be trapped and tackle uh, the ingrown hair at the, the root of the problem essentially. It's also antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory both of which are also really fab um, things that we want to be able to, to use to tackle ingrown hairs. Now products often contain a combination of salicylic acid and alpha hydroxy acid which work on the surface of the skin to help slough off the surface skin cells as well. But those two ingredients combined are going to do a really, really great job at helping to prevent but also treat those stubborn ingrowns. It's important that your clients do use these things properly because mm -hmm. sometimes they do overuse them, um, especially the guys, <laughs> I hate to say it, they do kind of go a little bit overboard thinking the more they use it, the better the results are going to be. And and that's not always the case because sometimes these products can be quite drying, you can get quite a harsh peeling effect. So you, you need to kind of make sure that your clients are using them properly and not overusing them because dry skin is actually going to make the problem worse in the long run. Another thing that I've noticed that a lot of, of companies are doing now, which I think is really, really great, is that they're introducing um, ingredients into these ingrown hair products that help to tackle hyperpigmentation. Because as we all know, um, stubborn ingrowns, and particularly where clients pick, and we all have pickers amongst our client base, <laughs> sometimes you can get that darkening in the skin, that hyperpigmentation once an ingrown hair has started to fade. So some companies now are introducing these uh, ingredients that help to tackle that. So the ingredients to look for there, I things like azelaic acid, um, arbutin, kojic acid, licorice acid, all of these ingredients work in slightly different ways, but essentially they help to uh, inhibit the formation of melanin and in some cases help to disperse it as well. So particularly in darker skin tones, which can be especially prone to that hyperpigmentation, these are really, really great added benefits for you to be looking for in your ingrown hair products. That's great. And um, just before we move on to the next question, I just had a couple of little mini questions I want to fire back. And the first one was about Lisa, and you said about um, body brushing. How often should um, therapists have their clients body brushing then in between appointments and um, waxing appointments? I, I bought personally body brush daily because not only do you get the benefit of skin exfoliation, you get the benefit of increased circulation. So I do it to help with the old cellulite on the bum mm. um, um it's just generally good for the whole body circulation so you know if it's not done too vigorously to the point where you're making the skin sore body brushing can be done on a daily basis um maybe areas like the bikini line and underarm that's a little bit more sensitive maybe do every other day rather than sort of a daily but you can't do any harm in, in body brushing on a daily basis it's kind of part of my little ritual in the shower now mm. to use a body brush because a body brush won't get lubricated it won't get washed away or diluted so you can do that in the shower and Andy, it was really interesting um, what you mentioned about the products that can also help with pigmentation. Are there any particular ones that you would recommend that waxes invest in? There are. I'm very conscious that the seminar is sponsored by Salon <laughs> System. <so. laughs> can I mention, or would it be better? <laughs> we can post it at the end. <laughs> So the key ingredients to look for, things like azelaic acid, um, arbutin, um, kojic acid, licorice extract, nyanamicide, those sorts of things, mm. those are the, the key ingredients to be looking for. Cool. If and we'll pull some results up. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and 
Another common question is what tends to cause spots after waxing? Um, Andy, do you want to take this first? Yes, yeah. So spots are a sign that the exposed follicles have become irritated or, or infected. Um, particularly common with guys on the chest and back areas. These are very, very common areas for, for clients to break out after waxing, especially first time clients. It's a sensitive area. It does tend to get better with repeat appointments, um, but essentially this is why we tell clients to avoid anything that's going to irritate the skin. So nothing that's going to rub, whether that be clothing, uh, nothing that's going to irritate the freshly white skin, nothing that's going to get them too hot and sweaty. So that includes things like exercise, going to the gym, that sort of thing. It's important that clients keep the skin clean, cool and as calm as possible for the first couple of days after their waxing appointments. There are extra things that clients can do as well to help prevent those pimples. So using an antibacterial skin wash or a spray um, really helps in those instances. So things like tea tree, lemon myrtle, salicylic acid again is a great ingredient for helping to prevent and treat those pimples. They normally do disappear on their own after a, a, about a week. Um, if they last any longer than that, or if they become painful and boil-like, then it's often a good idea to recommend the client pop along and see their doctor. But normally they do do shift um, quite easily. Um, tips that I give my male clients to help prevent uh, the spots on the back in the chest as well. I like to recommend that they bring a clean, loose-fitting t-shirt with them to their appointment, especially if it's a hot, sunny day or they're coming to work, uh, sorry, coming to us straight from work in a collar and tie. There's nothing worse after getting waxed than putting on like tight clothing or a sweaty shirt that perhaps they've been in all day. It's putting on a nice, clean, loose-fitting t-shirt can help prevent that post-pluck irritation. Um, clean towels at home as well. It's amazing how many people um, um, <laughs> I won't mention my other half, but leaves the towel in the bathroom and uses it all week. Fresh towels are a good way of helping to prevent that. And if people really do suffer, then it might be an idea to think about fresh bed sheets as well, um, if they're still suffering with pimples and they've been to see you a few times. I think Lisa's going to look at uh, tips for working with spots on, on female clients. <laughs> Yes, I certainly am. A lot of those tips will apply for female clients as well. So obviously, if you've just had your legs waxed, don't go put in a pair of leggings or skin skinny jeans on. Um, make sure your underwear is nice, loose and fit and something that isn't going to rub in sort of creases and things like that. But most commonly, a lot of women get a lot of spots on their face after maybe a top lip wax or an eyebrow wax. Um, and I think a lot of the time clients go home and put makeup on too quickly they don't listen to the aftercare and I know sometimes you can put mineral based makeup on your eyebrows after but I think if you can leave anything off leave it off for a good sort of 24 hours because that will then help prevent any blockages and spots forming but I think a lot of people really do forget about things that they use constantly so whenever I've waxed somebody whenever my students have waxed the first thing you see somebody do is oh thank goodness that's done oh that's so much better um they've got bacteria on their hands and they're transmitting that bacteria to their skin, which is freshly waxed and vulnerable. So I would always stress to your clients, do not touch your skin after waxing. I actually get my clients and my students to sanitize their hands as they're being models or being clients, because then if you do touch your skin straight after, you know that the hands are freshly clean. And, or if you're asking them to help you assist in stretching, you've got clean hands going on the skin. So that limits that worry. And um, the other thing our, us women use to actually apply our makeup with is our makeup brushes. And we're always, you know, telling people to clean their brushes, clean their makeup bags, because there's so much bacteria on an old, dirty makeup brush. And then your or a sponge for your foundation. And you're then putting that all over your face and then adding to bacteria. And the other thing is our phones. If you've just had a face wax or a lip wax and you're there chatting away on your phone, the amount of rubbish that's on your screen is then going onto your face. So I would say be careful of phones if it's facial waxing. Um, and like Andy said, just make sure that the day you've had your waxing done, your sheets are fresh and clean, um, your pillowcase, so um, it's not kind of adding to that. So that, that would be my advice, definitely. But it's quite normal to get a few little red spots directly after waxing. That's just the instant reaction. So don't be scared of that, that will go down. But it's those little pimples that come up sort of hours after and days after that we need to avoid. And I think just making sure your client is fully aware of the aftercare is really, really important. Yeah, I think that's all really solid advice. And I think the mobile thing's so interesting. I remember reading somewhere that actually your mobile is dirtier than a toilet seat. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's just worth <laughs> bearing that in mind, people. 
Oh my god, there's some at the door. I'm gonna have to ignore that. I'm so sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> um, so the next big common question is how can waxes improve their speed and their technique? Um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to take this first. Yeah, sure. Um, I always say speed is about being confident. Um, so making sure that you're really confident with your waxing spatula, you're confident in holding it, confident in loading the spatula with the wax, because the more wax you can get on your spatula, the bigger the surface you can cover and the quicker you can get through your wax. But most importantly, I think speed is down to being organized, making sure that you've got your room set up, everything's where it needs to be. And as I love Andy's phrase, actually, make sure you've got some wheels. So make sure you've got your trolley on wheels so that you can wheel the trolley around with you as you're working from area to area. And then you're not having to sort of run to and fro all the time, sort of adding time to your treatment. And also, if your trolley isn't right next to you, that's when you can get a little bit messy. And when you get messy, that's what slows you down because you're having to stop and clean up and change gloves and all sorts of things. So I would say confidence with your spatula is key when it comes to working quickly. Having a good wax as well that you can work with, making sure that you've got everything where you need it and being really organized. Absolutely. And I think there's there's kind of a fine line, isn't there, between speed and, and haste, isn't there? I mean, we're, we've become almost obsessed uh, in the UK with speed waxing. Um, and speed waxing really is just about being efficient. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the fastest waxer in the West, as long as you're charging an appropriate amount for the service that you're providing and you're making profit from that. Obviously, we don't want clients to be gathering cobwebs on the couch, but um, you know, there's, it, there is that fine line between clients getting a really, really great service that's efficient, but then perhaps feeling like they're being rushed in and out or like they're on a production line. So there's three quick tips that I've got, that I've learned over the years that have really, really helped me in terms of speeding up treatments. The first one is to send your client consultation forms in advance. Um, it makes a huge difference to be able to send your, your consultation forms electronically um, via an online booking system. It just means that you're not spending that five minutes, 10 minutes filling out a form, especially as we're going to be going back into a slightly different environment with all of the extra time spent on having to clean and, and, and look at ways of preventing coronavirus. But being able to send those consultation forms in advance just helps to cut down your treatment room time. It also has the added benefit of highlighting any potential issues that a client might have before they set foot through your treatment door. So it might be that they, uh, they've shaved too recently, for example, or they have a medical condition that you need to address. And if you know that in advance, it means you can address it um, rather than wasting their time if they turn up and you can't actually actually wax them. The second tip is uh, don't hang around waiting for your hot wax to set. And this is one of the great things about modern hot waxes is that they are flexible. They stay flexible on the skin. So you can lay multiple strips at a time. You don't have to put one on at a time and then get it off at exactly the right point out of fear that it's going to become brittle and snap when you try to remove it. So don't hang around waiting for wax to set. Apply multiple strips. You don't need to worry about your, your wax becoming difficult to remove. If in the summertime or you're working in a hot warmer part of the body, places like the bikini line, the underarms, the inner thigh, for example, the bottom. You can also use a damp cotton pad, wipe over the top, over the surface of your hot wax. If you're finding it's a little gummy, taking a little long to set, and it will set it up nice and quickly. So that makes sure that, uh, uh, that your treatment times are shorter as well. And the third tip, this is something I learned the hard way, and actually from my own bad habits, is uh, stay in the room while your client's getting changed at the end of their treatment. Um, I can guarantee you, and I speak from personal experience, if you leave the treatment room once the client has, you finished the wax, um, the first thing your customer is going to do, because this is the first thing I do, is check their phone. I pick it up, I'll perhaps go on Twitter, have a little Thank look you. on Instagram, um, and I'll be hanging around looking at my phone rather than putting my clothes back on. So if you stay in the treatment room while your when you're finished, while your client is getting changed, you can use that time to clean your wax pots empty the bins, put fresh linen down, disposable linen, uh, and get the room ready for your next client. Start wiping things down as, uh, as well. And it just gently encourages your clients um, to get a wriggle on, basically. So it, again, it just helps to cut down your treatment room time. I think actually improving on your speed when we go back, when we all reopen is going to be quite important because we're going to have a lot longer in between treatments times now. Um, so we're not going to be getting as many clients in. So I think being quicker with your techniques with the clients you've got now is going to be quite important, like mm -hmm. Andy said, to get all the room ready. So that's that's a fantastic tip there. 
Great. And it'd be great to know what you guys think is the best way of attracting more male clients. Oh, so um, I think we, this is this is something that we get asked quite a lot. Male waxing has been on the rise for, for many years, becoming more and more popular. And lots of salons and therapists want to throw open their doors and welcome male clients, which is which is fantastic. Um, I think there's a lot of fear in the industry that you have to dive straight in and start offering full body waxing or manzillions. And a lot of therapists don't feel comfortable with that. They don't feel ready to, to start doing that. So I would say uh, start small if you're looking at introducing waxing for the first time to your, your guys. So you don't have to start straight off with intimate waxing. Smaller services like facial waxing, nostrils and ears, for example, um, knuckles and toes after a manicure and a pedicure. Um, those sorts of treatments are really, really easy to, to add to your existing services. They add great value for male clients. They're non-intimidating because they can be performed in chair if you're a, a lash or brow technician, if you're a hairdresser, a barber, a nail tech, for example. So they don't require a separate trip to the beauty room, so they, they can save on space as well. And they're non-intimidating, they're quick, uh, and they're relatively masculine treatments as well. So they're a great way of introducing guys to the magic of your waxing spatula for the first time. I would also say as well, um, what stops a lot of men from booking in for treatments in the first place is that fear of the unknown. They might not have any point of reference. It might be that they've only seen things on YouTube or on, on films, for example, that their mates or other halves might have got in there with some tales of terror. So the, that fear of the unknown can be a real obstacle for, for male clients. So anything you can do to take the mystery out of manscaping is, is going to go down well. Whether that's a list of frequently asked questions on your website, making the most of social media, things like Instagram, for example, Great thing about waxing, it's a very visual treatment. So um, everybody, I mean, I posted a, a, a used nostril wax spatula on Instagram the other day, and, and people love that kind of thing. You know, they like to see before and after shots of chest waxing, back waxing, for example, those little boomerang videos of wax strips being pulled off. Anything you can do to help take the mystery out of it um, is going to go a really, really long way for, for attracting the guys. And I would say um, if you're in a salon and you're not doing any male clients at the moment, you have got all those female clients that you work on with partners, boyfriends, brothers, cousins, friends, husbands that could bring in so, many, so much more business. So I would do incentives to your female clients if they bring a friend or a husband or a brother along um, for them to encourage them to get it done. So just talk to your female clients about what you're planning on offering. And then they'll go home and they'll discuss it and they'll say, actually, I wouldn't mind you going in and having that done. So definitely get, you know, talk to your female clients about what's on offer. And I also think one of the things that does um, make men a little bit scared of coming into a salon as if the salon does look too feminine they might feel too embarrassed to come in so I think if you can make your reception areas and your treatment rooms look unisex if that's the right word just make it look that you know it caters for both male and female clients I would also say as well Kerry ann Angus did a fantastic webinar on working with male clients a couple of weeks ago that's through the the pro beauty um I think it's on Facebook, isn't it? And it's on YouTube yeah, as well. So Facebook and YouTube. that's a really, really good webinar. Give some great ideas for, for working with male clients. So check that out for sure. Love the whole visual thing of the nostril wax, Andy, and go check that out afterwards. Everyone um, loves the nostril wax. <laughs> it's weirdly satisfying, those kind of yeah. images. Um, but yeah, I guess the next question, um, which is quite an important one, is what are the most common reasons for skin trauma when waxing? I don't know if you want to start, Lisa. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would probably say the most common um, skin traumas you're going to get is bruising. Um, and bruising tends to occur mostly when you're not stretching the skin. So if the client hasn't been put and has adopted the right position, um, then we can kind of cause bruising on the skin or if you're not stretching the skin enough. So ways to prevent that is to make sure you know your positioning, make sure you know that your client is flexible enough to go into those positions. And if not, 
adopt a different position that is going to maximize the stretch. Um, get the clients involved, get them to sanitize their hands and help you stretch to really ensure that you've got the tautness in the client's skin. Um, other things that can include uh, that can cause bruising is certain types of medications. So you're looking at things like skin thinners. So um, anything that is cancer treat any cancer um, medications can cause bruising aspirin ibuprofen and some steroids can also cause bruising so make sure you do a thorough consultation before you start and make sure they're not taking any of those medications that can actually cause that if you do bruise a client then obviously you need to apologize make sure you don't do it again and bruises do tend to disappear quite quickly if they're not so severe um, but yeah make sure your technique is there because pulling the wax strip off wrong can actually cause a bruise if you lift it up rather than back um, to follow the contour of the skin um, going over bends make sure you kind of break your wax application up so you're not kind of going round a bend because the skin isn't tight enough if you do that so it's about technique it's about checking contraindications and medications and it's about the, the, the stretch in the skin that is so important Absolutely. The, the other thing that we we find that people ask us about a lot is grazing or skin lifting. That's one of the other big traumas that, uh, that the skin can experience during during waxing. And I noticed actually Adele asked a question about um, grazing earlier. Uh, guys, I've seen you, you, you have seen the questions come up in the chat box. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we're going to run through the questions we, we've got here and then ask us again at the end so we don't forget otherwise you might forget to go back through the chat box but in terms of grazing that's that can be recognized by a pink or shiny patch of skin it's just a sign that the uppermost layers of the epidermis have been removed um, by the wax there are lots of different reasons why this can happen if it does happen to you welcome to the club you know you're not the first one um, it's happened to lots of us um, one of the most common reasons is uh, the skin can be hot and clammy and we're all going to be going, hopefully, all going to be going back to our salons in the middle of summer. We've had a beautiful hot spring so far, so hopefully we'll get a nice warm summer as well. But that does mean that your clients might be arriving warmer than normal. They might be perspiring more than normal, both of which can make it difficult to get a nice, thin, even application of wax. And it makes it more difficult to remove the wax cleanly. It can tug a little bit as well. So make sure you're cleaning the skin properly first, a little bit of powder can help in most circumstances as well and just stop the wax from from sticking and tugging um, dry skin very dry dehydrated sun damaged skin can also cause grazing um, because the wax will just stick to those uppermost layers um, in those instances something like a, a tiny little drop of oil can just create a lipid barrier to help prevent um, the skin from from lifting when you go over those areas Thin or fragile skin, this same as with, with bruising, thin or fragile skin can be co caused by uh, poor health, um, simply getting older, medication, uh, especially things like uh, steroid medication, um, some skincare products, so retinoids, for example, anti-aging products, anti-aging treatments, all of these things can cause some thinning of the skin, as can acne medication, and we're going to come on to that in our, in our next question. Uh, but these are all things that we need to be looking for as part of our consultation. Um, if somebody has got fragile skin, work in smaller sections. You know, you don't need to slather the entire area in, in wax if you have got somebody who's got more fragile skin. Working in smaller sections just allows you to keep that skin braced properly and perhaps switch to using a non-strip appealable wax in those areas if you're finding that, uh, um, that it's difficult to, to kind of keep that skin tight when you're using the strip wax. Um, also, uh, if the wax is too hot or too cold, both of those things can cause the wax to stick to the skin and, and lift those surface areas as well. Or it might simply be that it's a, a new product that you're not familiar with that you're still getting, getting used to. As Lisa said, as with bruising, um, it's important that you let your client know that it's happened. Um, just be very calm about it. Explain that the wax has got... So always blame the wax, I say, because mm -hmm. the wax doesn't have feelings. So always blame it on the wax. Say the wax has got stuck. Explain how it's going to look for the next couple of days. So if it's grazing, you might want to say to your client, um, you've got a little pink patch of skin here, nothing to worry about. You might notice that it, it, it scabs over or it might dry peel like sunburn over the next couple of days. Nothing to worry about. Pop a little bit of antiseptic cream on and give me a call if you've got any questions. And then you follow that up in a few days just to see how your client's getting on. If you just um, let your client know that's the important thing and be very calm about it, because if you don't, I can guarantee they're going to go home, they're going to spot it themselves and they're going to think that you're a terrible waxer. So always better to be upfront about these things right from the word go. Make a note of it on your record card. And if it is an injury that um, uh, 
uh, doesn't heal or has caused some problems, always contact your insurance provider as well. They're there to help. That's what they're there for. You know, they always say artists have erasers, um, beauty therapists have insurers. So that's what they're there for. I think as well with bruising, I forgot to mention, um, the length of the hair is quite important. So if you're working on underarm, back, chest, bikini line, and the hair is too long, just coming out of hibernation and we've been letting it grow all winter, um, you'll cause bruising then because the, the hair just tangles and mangles with the wax. You try to rip the strip off and it's going nowhere. It's just going to cause trauma and bruising to the skin. So check the length of the hair as well. The other thing I would say about grazing as well, I forgot to mention, make sure your client is using an SPF on the skin afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it's If you've caused, if there's some injury in the skin, some inflammation on the skin, and then they go out in the sun, they're more likely to burn on the area of skin trauma. And if they do burn in that area, again, it's more likely to hyperpigment. So it's really important that your clients do use a sunscreen. It's important they use a sunscreen after waxing on exposed areas anyway, but especially important on an area that has been, um, been caused some trauma. And we actually had a really interesting comment just from Susan on Facebook about this question as well. And she's um, also put bruising can occur also if the client jumps, which can happen with a nervous first time client, especially during the bikini wax. Um, do you guys have any advice for if something like that did happen? How to manage it? Um, I would just sort of explain what they've done and what that's likely to cause. So, you know, obviously just jump in moving which is then relaxing the stretch um so just try and sort of keep them calm um maybe sort of do some deep breathing exercises with them when you're about to rip the strip off so they manage that kind of nervous expectation a little bit better um but yeah i definitely I've, I've had clients like that where they jump before you're just back to do it or you're just back to do it and they pull their leg away and you've got the strip so um i think just make sure you explain first i think you do get an idea if somebody's a little bit nervous before you begin their whole demeanor their body language so i think you can kind of get an idea if they're going to be a bit jumpy and nervous beforehand explain the process, tell them what you're doing. And before you pull that strip off, if they are nervous and jumpy, let them know that you're going to do it. I'm sure we've all had clients where you've gone to pull and they clamp their, their knees shut on you as you're doing a bikini wax. There's nothing worse than that. And also my light bulb has just died. So I'm sorry that I'm now in half darkness. <laughs> Don't believe. worry, we can still see you lovely and clearly, Andy. Don't worry. <laughs> it's like an omen. Um, but yeah. And actually, Andy, you were mentioning a little bit about acne earlier. And can you wax somebody who is using anti-acne products? I don't know if you want to go first on this, Andy. This is, a, again, this is a question we get asked an awful lot. We're, we're living in, a, in an era where medication, skincare, treatments are, are changing all the time. Um, and sometimes it takes a while for us to, to catch up with, uh, with these new uh, ingredients or these new medications that can have an impact on waxing. Um, there are a couple of different types of acne medication that can impact on your waxing treatments. And the big one is isotretinoin. It's known as Veracutane, the brand name Veracutane here in the UK or Accutane in other parts of the world. It's a prescription only medication. And essentially the primary way that it works is it just helps to reduce the amount of oil that the sebaceous glands in the skin uh, are producing. The idea being that if there's less oil, um, the skin can renew itself more readily, um, the pores aren't gonna get clogged and there's less acne causing bacteria on, on the skin. Now it is a really, really great medication for, for acne. It gets fantastic results but it does also come with some quite serious side effects. And anyone who has ever been on Accutane or Accutane will know themselves what those are. Um, you can imagine if the skin isn't producing enough oil and it's also turning over, renewing itself more quickly, that the skin is going to be much drier and more fragile as a result. So the advice if somebody tells you that they are taking Roaccutane is no waxing whatsoever anywhere on the body because it's, it's taken as a tablet, so it affects the entire body any waxing at all while a client is taking Roaccutane and for six months after they stop taking it. Now that isn't a figure I've just pulled randomly out of the air, that's actually the official advice of the manufacturer themselves. And in my own personal experience, I've actually found that it can take up to a year in some cases for the skin to get completely back to normal. So it's always a good idea with a client who has been on Roaccutane to check the integrity of the skin, even if it's past that six month period, check the integrity of the skin, maybe wax a small section first before you go ahead and slap wax all over their back or their leg, um, which could cause some trauma. So with Accutane being a oral medication that will affect the entire body, there are some products on the market that you apply 
um, topically. So you just apply them locally. Um, and that's generally to sort of facial areas and some male, male clients could be maybe applying it to their back and shoulders, as can some female clients actually tend to suffer quite badly on their sort of chest and shoulders as well. These products tend to be um, prescription um, and they tend to be sort of what we call retinoids. So they tend to um, include Retina-A, Renova, uh, Differin, and also benzoyl peroxide. So any products that contain those ingredients, I would just avoid waxing in that local area where those products are applied. Um, and one of the things that I tend to find quite a lot is um, you might get somebody in their late teens, early 20s that might be using them, come along for their brows to be waxed. And what tends to happen is that although they're not putting it directly under the eye because you're not allowed to put it around the eye, the skin around your eye is 40% thinner or, you know, than the rest of the face. So it tends to act like blotting paper. And although they might be stopping applying the creams here, it can still bleed into those areas and you can still get grazing. So it's really important to make sure that you avoid working anywhere around those areas where those creams applied. Your Retina-A, your Renova, your Differin are going to be um, products that increase cellular renewal. So they help to desquamate the skin really quickly um, and increase cellular turnover like Handy's already mentioned. And then the benzoyl peroxide is more of an antiseptic, antibacterial, which helps to reduce the amount of bacteria on the skin. So any of those products being used, just don't wax in those areas where they're being applied. Great advice. And um, this is our last prepared question before we open the floor to questions from the audience. So if you do have any questions for Andy and Lisa, now is the time to pop them in the comment box and then we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Um, but I think this next question is a big question for all waxers out there at the moment. It's how can they prepare their clients for when they can finally reopen, which for beauty salons in England is estimated to be July 4th. But obviously it's dependent on if phase one and two go well and we're ready for phase three. So what's your advice, Lisa, for how waxers can prepare their clients? Um, just make sure you're following all the guidelines. There's still um, lots of things are changing. There's lots of things being said at the moment. So we're just going to follow official guidelines for you to make sure you're ready and your staff are all prepared. Um, but I think from a client point of view is just make sure really that you're um, emailing clients beforehand. So your clients aren't going to turn up on the day for the appointment, not knowing how you're going to look, what PPE you're wearing, um, not knowing if your prices have changed, for example. So just make sure emails are sent out, let clients know what changes in procedures are gonna be set in place. So they know not to bring their children maybe along to the salon. They know not to come in groups with their friends. Um, just make sure that they're aware of any price increases because the last thing you want is your staff getting the brunt of it. So if you've got you know, um, staff members waxing in there getting shouted at because the prices are higher or they're not allowed to come in or, you know, they're not being able to take as many clients in a day. I just think making sure they, they understand what those procedures are before you start, that's one way they can prepare their clients for what's coming. And also with the preparing them for their first wax with you when you they get, come to see you as well. Um, I mean, we've all been kind of adopting the mantra, be brave, don't shave and, and all of that over the last few weeks. We have to kind of be honest with ourselves. Some clients are going to have, got the razor out, got the hair removal cream out, or even attempted waxing themselves at home. It's, it, it's going to happen. So it's important to let clients know when you know you're reopening, that they need to leave a minimum of three weeks after they've shaved or used hair removal creams and a minimum of four weeks after they've attempted a home wax themselves in order to get best results. So it might be that if they've shaved the week before you're due to reopen, that they need to leave it a little bit longer before they, they come and see you. Also, as we mentioned earlier, in terms of ingrown hairs, get them exfoliating now if they aren't already moisturizing to keep their skin in tip-top condition it's going to lift those hairs up to the surface so that when they do come back to you for their first post-coronavirus wax and mm -hmm. um, that they're going to get better results remind them that there's no sun you know not to sunbathe too close to their appointment no heat treatments we can't wax sunburnt skin it has been glorious weather up until today and apparently <laughs> next week it's going to be horrid as well but you know keep our fingers crossed it's going to get nice and sunny again so again just remind people because people forget they haven't been to see us for a while no sunbathing we can't wax sunburnt skin and also to plan ahead it might be that people have a holiday in the diary um, 
whether we can fly anywhere by the time we open in July, who knows at the moment, but it might be that they've got a weekend away, for example, in the Cotswold, something like that. Um, and they need to leave enough time before that, that holiday to get the best waxing results. So if they're planning to go to the beach, for example, um, and their holiday is two weeks after you reopen, they might be desperate to come and see you the first week that you open, but then their hair's gonna to start to grow back by the time they go off on their holiday. So again, just encouraging them to plan ahead and work back from that date so that they get enough appointments in, which might mean they can't come and see you the first week that you open. I think we're going to have two extremes. We're going to have people that have shaved and have got really short stubby hair. And then we're going to have Chewbacca's that are just <laughs> overgrown. I don't think there's going to be a happy medium. I think we're going to have not enough or too much. I'm we're going to be working overtime for some of them. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, they I think. Earn them their, their money. That's, that's mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one thing's for sure. Waxes are going to be busy um, when they can reopen their businesses. Waxes and their time. Business. Look how long my hair is. <laughs> Everyone's got mega long hair. The hairdressers, the waxers, the beauty therapists, everyone's dying for them to reopen. Um, but I think one thing Lisa said actually about your prices going up is so important to incorporate the cost of the PPE in your treatment prices when you reopen. So make sure that you work out what that is now and you're ready when you're open so that you're not selling yourself short and incurring that cost yourself because you still mm. need to make a profit. Um, but they were all of our pre-prepared questions um, and lots of questions have been coming in on Facebook and on Zoom. And if you guys have any other questions, pop them in the chat box and we will get Lisa and Andy to answer them. Um, but I will just get going with a few. Um, so we've got a question from Sam Pierce. Hi, Sam. And um, she's put amazing webinar. Thank you. And she's asked, do you have a protocol in place when dealing with underage clients? And what, in your professional opinion, is too young? have a wax so um this will depend very much where you are in the country because i know that there it's slightly different in scotland compared to uh, to england for example um, i would always go by what your insurance company tell you because that's where the, the buck stops and it may be that your insurance company will allow you to perform body waxing and facial waxing on clients under the age of 16 providing there is a parent or guardian present in the room and that they countersign the consultation form as well. Um, some insurance companies are happy for you to do intimate waxing on clients uh, over the age of 16, a lot of them say over 18, um, and there's nothing wrong for you to actually put your own policy in, in place. So for example, I won't wax anybody at my salon under the age of 18. Mm. I work on my own. Um, before I, got, I was in waxing, I worked in the probation service and it was drummed home to me never to be on my own uh, with a, uh, a young person, as it were just for your protection and their peace of mind as well. So for my own personal working practice, I, I don't wax anyone under the age of 18. That's a personal choice. I think as well, if you are gonna work on um, anyone under the age of 16, um, so for example, if you've got maybe a 15 year old who wants eyebrow done, um, yeah, you do need to make sure you've got that parent there. But also it depends on, on, the, on the client because I have had some young girls come to me being brought by their mothers who have looked like bunnies in the headlights. They have been scared to death and they've not been ready for it. It's been the parent that has been encouraging it rather than the actual child themselves. So I think there's so many things you need to consider. Definitely the main one is going to be insurance. Check with your insurance company whether they will insure you. But I'm like Andy, when it comes to intimate waxing, they have to be 18 or over. I won't do anyone under the age of 18 because of what I'm asking them to do. But that is that that's kind of something that I feel quite personal about. So everyone's going to feel slightly different. But also at the end of the day as well, if you have got somebody who I don't know is being bullied or teased because they've got thick dark hair on their arms or their legs and you know I, I don't want a young girl to take a razor to her brows to get rid of a mono brow and end up shaving off her brow or causing damage to her skin so I, I just think there's a number of things you need to take into consideration I don't think you can have necessarily one set age for everybody when it comes to certain elements but intimate waxing I agree with Andy I'm 18 or over it's so tricky as well because we're, we get very British about it and all over the world it, it, it's different. I remember when I used to work with a French waxing company when I was training in France, they were waxing clients as young as 12 years old and it was just the norm. They were doing, they started leg waxing at 12. It wasn't frowned upon, it was just part of what they did. Um, other cultures, 
they'll be threading the uh, the eyebrows, for example, again, very, very young. So it, it does, there are so many uh, equations to take into, into account, but I think here, it definitely stops with your insurance company. Yeah, great advice, guys. Um, and we have another question from Adele Hyam Gray. Hi, Adele. Um, she's asked, I recently had a couple of clients whose skin has lifted on the brow area. I've used non-strip wax with a tiny amount of powder instead of an oil underneath. Could this be the reason? I make sure I place tension to the area too. Yep. So it, it could be it, it could be that the wax was perhaps a little too warm or the, the skin was clammy. There are, as we said earlier, there are lots of reasons why it can happen. One thing just to be aware of, especially with facial waxing and intimate waxing, I found if I have had a client who has grazed, that area is more likely to graze the next time they come and see. It can take a while for the, the skin's integrity to, to repair fully. So just be aware of that. Perhaps work in slightly smaller sections or if in any doubt, tweeze the hair in that area for that particular client next time they come and see you. And I would check as well um, what skincare they're using um, because quite often eye serums and eye creams can, can kind of contain the... the um, AHAs and things like that so glycolic acids and whether or not they're having any facial treatments any chemical peels I would just be checking to make sure what they're using at home if they're having under any other facial um, treatments because they can quite often cause the skin to be a bit thin and they may not think it's relevant to tell you they may have forgot to tell you. Mm, no that's so true um, and we have a question from Gemma Broadbent. Hi Gemma. Um, she said, if you contact clients a few days later after an appointment to check on them, would you say that a phone call would be best or an email? And with both, how would you start the conversation? I don't think I'd check on a client unless there was an issue. Um, if, you know, if everything was all right during the treatment and everyone left happy, I wouldn't necessarily need to contact them. Is that kind of what she meant within the question or did she mean if there was a problem? She didn't mention about problems, she just said if I contacted them a few days later to check in on them, um, would a phone call or an email be best? I guess more like a kind of follow-up um, email is kind of the yeah. impression I'm getting with this. I think if, there, if there was a problem with the treatment, so if there was a little bruise or a little graze, um, then maybe I would just give them a little call a couple of days after. But I sometimes feel it's best to let them contact you. I don't know what you feel, Andy. I think if if there's been an issue, this was this was a something that uh, an American waxer, Lorena story, taught me years and years ago. Is that if something does go wrong, own up to it and and follow follow it up because it shows the client that you that you care. It also gives you the opportunity to um, address any ongoing issues that might be that might be present. Um, Often when something goes wrong, if a client's unhappy, they don't always let us know. They might just kind of run for the hills and tell all their friends or put it on Facebook that they've had a terrible experience. But often as therapists ourselves, we're the last people to know if a client's unhappy. So if something has gone wrong, like a bruise or a graze, for example, I personally would want to contact the client and be proactive. I tell them that they can contact me if they've got any questions over the next few days, but I would want to be contacting them in a day or two um, just to say, and again, this is, this is, Laurie's tip is I can't take credit for this um, you know phone or email and say hi Lisa it's Andy from Axiom how are you doing just calling to check in and, and, and see how you are after your treatment and um, did anything come of the the little pink patch of skin that we discussed or is, is everything okay and that gives your client the opportunity to turn around and say oh no everything's fine or if it's not fine to go well actually I, I have been a little bit worried because um, it's still a bit sore or whatever the issue might be it just gives that relationship a little bit of a boost and, and your clients more likely to then come back if you stay in contact with them and you communicate with them you know beauty treatments are all about communication um it, communication is king we always say don't we um, and and no more so than in in those kind of circumstances i guess as well if you phone up a couple of days after if if the, it hasn't got any better and there is a problem you can then remind them to go and maybe seek attention um from their GP, which maybe they wouldn't have done if you didn't call. But yeah, I would only kind of contact if there was an issue. Brilliant. And um, Yasmin would love to know what is the ideal length that hair should be before waxing? And she wants to know in terms of millimetres or centimetres, if you guys can be that precise. <laughs> 
I'm no good converting from, from all the different dimensions. I would probably say about sort of a quarter of an inch. Um, I don't know what that refers to within millimeters. <laughs> it's the thing with with hair length is that especially if a client has been shaving or using hair removal creams is that if they don't leave it long enough after their their shave some of the hair will be long enough but because hair grows in cycles and the, the growth cycles as we know aren't naturally synchronized while some of that hair may be long enough a lot of it won't be a lot of it's still going to be too short or indeed growing through so if you wax them after a week or two weeks after they've shaved or used hair removal creams you're not going to get completely smooth results and they're going to get regrowth and stubble um, a couple of days after their appointment and they're going to think you've done a rubbish job so ideally hair should be i would say about half a centimeter for the for the best results some waxes will get out shorter hair um and we all know clients as well that have got hair longer than that and yet for some reason it's the toughest hair known to to humankind um so i would say about half a centimeter about five millimeters uh, something i see a lot of people saying is about the length of a grain of rice. Now, whether that's whole grain rice or basmati rice or just who knows, but that's that's kind of a rough indication for clients for them to have a visual. Um, but I would stick with the four weeks after waxing, three weeks after shaving or hair removal cream, and you're much likely to get better results rather than relying on a client to get out a tape measure or, or a ruler and, and have a little measure. And like Andy said, it really does depend on the type of wax you use. So obviously strip wax and sort of hot peelable waxes are going to perform slightly different. So it will depend on what type of wax you're working on, working with, sorry. Yeah. A little trick if you have got a client who's got very short stubborn hair um, and they're desperate to be waxed, you know, they're, they're a regular waxer with you, but perhaps they've come in a week sooner than normal because they're, they're going on holiday. You might find if you're doing a bikini wax, for example, on underarm, you might have a couple of those short up into the wax itself wait for it to set complete that with your your normal waxing technique but don't do that on a, on a client who's always coming in too soon because they're you know that's going to take you forever <laughs> you're, you're never going to get smooth results it is a great tip actually it's actually really satisfying because you can always hear each little hair coming out it's a really satisfying thing to do <laughs> <laughs> I just think Melanie asked actually about if a client yeah I was going to say about her because it ties in with what you guys are saying it's oh, perfect no Andy it's so good you're watching it and making my job a bit easier but um Lisa just so you know as well um we've got a viewer called Melanie who's asked um when clients come in with really long hair that needs trimming before waxing do you do that or do you ask the clients to do it um, I prefer to do it so I can trim it to the right length because when you've asked clients to do it quite often they get a little bit scissor happy or clipper happy and end up trimming it too short um, and then I'm stuck because I can't do it so I, I actually prefer to do it and if I'm trimming a lot of hair I would always have an extra piece of couch roll underneath their bottom if it's on the bikini line or underneath their their chest or back if it's underarms and then once I've done with my trimming I can just brush all the loose hair away roll up the couch and get rid of all that loose hair. Cause there's nothing worse with waxing with loads of loose hairs flying around. So you kind of want to keep it nice and clean, but no, it's something that I prefer to do. Would you agree, Andy? I agree hundred percent. Nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we go into the next question, just um, Gillian on Facebook has just asked about the date that I said. So that date, July 4th is for England only that estimated July 4th reopening date for beauty salons. Scotland has said that they will be later than that. They haven't given a specific date. All they've said is that beauty salons will open in phase three. Um, but we will keep you guys updated as soon as the government um, announces more information. But yeah, that was just for England that date, not for the rest of the UK. Um, actually in Ireland, parts of Ireland, I actually think it's July 20th double check that but I think that's what it is and the um, the other day put on that it could be significantly later for beauty and hair salon so yes um, I know. <laughs> it's an absolute waiting game everyone's waiting to find out um, but I just wanted to let you know that Julian because yeah it's confusing um different parts of the UK have different opening dates um Amanda Green has asked about clients with diabetes is that still a no-go for waxing she said it's been a while since I waxed and I'm just getting back into it <laughs> okay you know funny enough this was this was something that myself and Lisa 
discussed when we were uh, looking through the questions um, and we decided not to include it because it, it, it can be uh, very insurer specific. Right, yeah. Having, having uh, family members and friends with diabetes uh, myself, this was one of my soapbox issues many years ago. Um, and I was incredibly frustrated that all of the insurers were turning around and saying, no, you can't whack someone with diabetes. You can't do a manicure. You can't do a pedicure. You can't do this, you know, basically kind of away, away, because there was a lot of fear and misinformation about diabetes. Treatment options weren't perhaps as advanced as they are now. Um, if you think about the way that uh, diabetics test their blood sugar levels, they prick the finger um, and they don't wrap it in a sterile bandage. Most people are like that. Um, the main issue with, with diabetic clients, and it doesn't matter whether it's type one or type two, it's about the effect it has on, on the skin and, and, and the body, is that it can long-term or mismanaged diabetes um, can cause macrovascular damage, which means that the skin might be a little thinner. It might take longer for wounds to heal. For example, people might have loss of sensation though. There are lots of others, but those are the, the main things. So um, when I, um, consulted with Diabetes Care UK years and years ago, they would basically turn around and said, providing a client has their diabetes under control, whether that's with diet, exercise or medication, and there aren't any associated complications, there should be no reason why you can't wax a diabetic client, providing you take the proper care. Now, that's the advice from them. However, I am also very, very aware that a lot of insurance companies still require you to obtain a doctor's letter of permission before you wax a diabetic client. So I can sit here and say, this is the advice from um, you know, the leading diabetes charity in the UK. But as we said earlier with, with uh, client age, the buck stops with your insurance provider. So you must absolutely check with your insurer what their, uh, their requirements are because you will have to work to that. And everybody reacts slightly differently as well with diabetes. You know, there isn't, you know, everybody is so different. So, you know, one client could react quite badly and then another one wouldn't. So it's very unique to that individual. So like Andy said, it's, it's down to your insurer, really. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Just a couple of things I want to update. Anybody who's been asking if they can watch this again, this will be going on professional beauty's youtube page tomorrow otherwise it'll be sitting on pb's facebook page indefinitely so you can watch it again on those and take all this information in um, and also just about the island thing a lovely andrea price has just said on here it's southern island that's july 20th i couldn't remember if it was south or north and again that is an estimate that's not definitive it really depends on if they hit all the requirements for each phase so it's just a guideline it's not definitive um and yeah i just want to say thank you so much to andy and lisa for joining me today it's been absolutely informative been absolutely blown away with all the comments people have been saying it's so informative it's been great lovely listening to you both so much love on facebook and on zoom and of course i want to say thank you a big thank you to our sponsor salon system for helping us with this webinar today their link is in our comment box on Facebook and on Zoom, so you can check out their full range of waxing products and their stockists. But otherwise, this is all we have time for today. We do have a webinar tomorrow with Sam Pierce, who's going to be talking about how to manage your mental health as a salon owner during this difficult time, and also some tools and techniques you can pass on to your team, which will be really helpful. But otherwise, thank you so much, guys. It was great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Andy. You're amazing. Very quickly say to Miriam, because I saw she asked about four times about oh, sorry. <laughs> coloration and pigmentation. Miriam, we, we, we had a quick chat about pigmentation and ingredients to look for right at the beginning of the yeah. seminar. So it's available on Facebook. I think it'll be uploaded to, to, to YouTube. We've got some ingredients that we've suggested as part of that. So have a little look at that. Sorry, Amanda. To no, in. that's fine. Sorry, there's so many questions, even on Facebook. And actually, just going back to a couple of people, um, the other webinar that Andy was talking about that was just about male waxing, and that was with Kerry Ann Angus. And if you just type in professional beauty on our YouTube page, you'll find it quite recently in our videos. It was only a couple of weeks ago, and it's all about how to market male waxing treatments. Um, and yeah, it was a great session, so definitely worth checking that out too. And I'm sorry for everyone whose questions we didn't get to go through. It's just it's tough, but um, thank you so much for joining, and I really hope that you found it informative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.